Hello, I'm Kathy Davidson, and I'd like you to join me as I minister the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus, which is the power of God. Let's pray. My Heavenly Father, open our eyes that we can see. Open our ears that we can hear. Open our hearts like you did for Lydia, that we can attend unto the things which are spoken. Turn us from darkness to light, from the power of Satan unto you. And Father, I ask a spirit of grace on this message. A spirit of grace. What we didn't ask for, what we didn't deserve, but you do anyway. Father, I ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. I would like to share another testimony. Back in the late 80s, I had two small children and a house that was pretty brand new. And there were times when I would, I had an issue with my back. And it would come to the point where I would spend the day doing housework, cleaning, and washing clothes. And by the end of the afternoon, my back hurt so bad that I could not even walk. I was so determined to get the house done that I would take that last load of laundry and to put it away, I would lay it on my lap and I would scoot to the room it belonged to because I couldn't walk. My back hurt too bad. Well, it, during that time, one evening during church, Dole Davidson was ministering. He stood up and he said, I believe the Spirit of God would like me to pray for people with back problems my hands shot up and there were several of us a woman went in front of me and then I came to the front and Dole asked me what my problem was and I told him about the back pain to where it would get to I couldn't walk and he asked me to come up on the on the platform and he grabbed a folding chair and he said I want you to sit in this chair and I want you to scoot your back as far back as you can I did and he took both of my bottom, my, both of the bottom of my feet and he held out my legs and he said, I believe you've got one leg shorter than the other. Well, when he first said this, I wasn't, it, it made me very nervous because I had seen programs where TV evangelists would grab somebody's leg and pull it out. And I didn't want to be part of that, but I wanted the back pain to go away. And though put my legs back down or put my feet back down on the ground and he began to pray. And the wildest thing happened. While he was praying, my right hip went numb. In fact, it went so numb that I could feel it, it, it tingle. And I laughed because of the tingling. And then as he continued to pray, I felt I felt the bone in my right leg, that upper bone, I felt it grow. And it grew about three quarters of an inch. I was shocked. I was astounded. And so thankful. Do you know since that time, that the Lord Jesus grew out my leg that three quarters inch. I've never had back aches like that again. That is the kingdom. Do you know that that's why Jesus came? Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. Not destroy us, but to destroy the works of the devil. And he came so that I wouldn't have that back ache. And you know what? That does that power that does those things that destroy the work of the devil, that is the kingdom of God. That's the kingdom. Now we want that kingdom. So let's go and we're going to go. I'm going to show you again, like I did last week. I want to show you that Jesus tells us how to get that power in our own lives, how to walk in that kingdom power how to walk in the miracles. He tells us this, how to, in the very first message he gives. Did you know that? Let's go there again. Mark 1. I'm going to begin in verse 14. It says, Now after John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee, preaching 
the gospel of the kingdom of God. Preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. The gospel. Now, what does he say in verse 15? How do we get, how did he preach the kingdom of the gospel? He says it in verse 15 and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent you and believe the gospel. The time is fulfilled. It's here. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent you. How do we get the kingdom of God? How do we get the kingdom of God? Jesus tells us right here, repent you and believe the gospel. Now, we talked about this the last couple of messages. The kingdom of God, what is it? What is it? 1 Corinthians 4.20 says, For the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. The kingdom of God is not in word, it's in power. Power. Now that power can come through the word, but the kingdom of God is power. It's in power. And we also know from Luke 17 that the kingdom of God is within us. Luke 17, verse 20, The kingdom of God cometh not with observation. Neither shall they say, Lo here or lo there. Jesus speaking. He says, Behold, the kingdom of God is within you. Within you. The kingdom of God will be within you. And the kingdom of God we just heard is with power. So where does the power reside? It's going to reside within you. And that kingdom of God, one other thing about the kingdom I want to go over, and that is Luke 12, 32, where Jesus said, little flock, little flock, it is the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Have you ever considered that? Jesus, our Messiah, say, it is the Father's good pleasure. It'll make the Father happy to give you the kingdom, to give you the power, to put it in you, to put it where it's inside of us, within us. So how does he do it? Back to Mark 1.15. Jesus tells us how he does it. Mark 15 the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God, that power that's within you, that the Father wants you to have. How do we get it? Repent you and believe the gospel. Repent you and believe the gospel. Now, repent. We talked about that before. The word repent simply means Look it up in your concordance. Get that concordance out. Dust it off. and Start to study. Show yourself approved to God. Look it up. Repent there means just to change what you're thinking. Change the way you're thinking. So instead of thinking this way, we're going to repent. We're going to change the way we think. And what are we going to do? We're going to believe the gospel. We're going to believe. The gospel, believe, trust in, rely on, adhere to, commit to the gospel. Now let's go back and let's go over again the meaning, the definition of the gospel because it is in here. The definition defined, the gospel defined is in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. Moreover, brethren, the Apostle Paul speaking, he said, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which in wherein you received and wherein you stand. Do you see what Paul preached? He preached the gospel. Jesus said, repent and believe the gospel. Jesus preached the gospel. The Apostle Peter preached the gospel. Do you know all the apostles? They preached the gospel. So if they preach the gospel, that's what we need to preach. All right? The Apostle Paul said, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, 
which also you have received and wherein you stand. Verse 2, by which also you are saved. Whoa. Did you know you are saved by the gospel? Did you know that you are saved by the gospel? Paul preached the gospel, and therein is where we are saved. We are saved by that gospel. Do you know we are not saved by the Ten Commandments? Do you know Paul says doesn't say here that we are saved by the law of Moses? What does Paul say saves us here? He said what saves us here is the gospel. So we need to know exactly what that gospel is. Well, the bona fide definition of that gospel is right here in verses 3 and 4. Verse 3, For I declared unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how, and here is the gospel, how that Christ died according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. That is the gospel defined. That is the good news. People say, and you look up the word gospel, it means good news. But you got to know what the good news is. Well, the good news is that Jesus died according to the scriptures, and he was buried, and he rose again according to to the scriptures. That's what we trust in. That's what we commit to. That's what we adhere to. That's what we believe. That's what we change the way we think and we believe this. Now the last message I talked about the, the testimony of where God spoke to me. When my daughter had an ear infection, she had had several and you are welcome to go and listen to these messages over and over because you will find when the Holy Ghost ministers a message through a person, you will find that when you go, you need to listen to it over and over and over because that word is like a hammer and it's like a fire and it'll burn into your heart. And I, that night when God spoke the words to me about the gospel, when I was desperate that my daughter was in pain and she was crying, and I said to the father, what do I have to do to get you to come down here and heal her? And out of my mouth came these words, Kathy, the sacrifice has already been made. It was at that moment I realized that the death, burial, and resurrection was the sacrifice that was made for my daughter. And it had already been made. Jesus had already made the sacrifice. And the sacrifice is the gospel that he died, that he was buried, and that he was raised again for my daughter. And as I shared last week, she when she fell asleep at the end of my prayer. And she woke up the next day with no ear infection and she hadn't had one since. And she is going on 35 years old. And not only that, but I had three boys after her and we never had one ear infection again in that household. Why? Because Jesus died. Because he was buried because he was raised again for me and my children. And I trust in, relied on, adhered to that gospel and the work of the kingdom, the power was manifested. Now let's go look at why the words that Jesus died, he was buried and rose again, that why those words bring the power. And I want to say this as we go there. It is not the gospel that Jesus died for our sins. That is only part of it. It takes all three parts for it to be the gospel. The gospel is that Jesus died and he was buried and he was raised again. 
If Jesus wasn't raised again, then there is no gospel. And we are on our way to destruction. It is absolutely necessary that that gospel include the resurrection. And we will see that here. Turn with me to Isaiah 53. And I'm going to begin in verse 1. You know, this gospel that Isaiah is speaking here, this gospel that Isaiah wrote down, that the, that the Spirit of Christ revealed to the prophet Isaiah 700 years before he showed up on this earth. 700 years before he was born. Let's go. Verse 1. Who has believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? That arm, you will see, is Jesus. For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry ground. He has no form nor comeliness. When you go back to Psalm 22, when you go back to Isaiah 52, you will see the body of Jesus was, was broke apart. The bones dislocated. And they dislocated to the point, every bone in Jesus dislocated to where you couldn't even tell he was a man. Right? It says, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Verse 3, he is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, of pain. That word is pain. A man of sorrow, of pain, and acquainted with sickness. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely, surely, the Spirit of Christ in, the, in Isaiah is speaking, and he said, surely, surely. You can't get any more sure than surely. Surely, this man, this person that Isaiah is speaking about, has borne our sicknesses, borne our sicknesses, carried our pain, carried our pain, carried our sickness, our pain, yet we did esteem him smitten, spitten, of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. He was bruised for our iniquities. Not his, ours. Verse 5. For he was wounded for our transgressions. Not his transgressions, our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace, that word peace, our prosperity, our safety, our security, our welfare, our peace with God was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. In verse 6, all we like sheep have gone astray, all of us. And have turned everyone to his own way. And look at this next line. And the Lord. And the Lord. That's Jehovah. And the Father. Jehovah. Laid on him. Laid on Jesus. As he was on the cross. The iniquity. Of us all. Jesus was on the tree. Jehovah himself, the Spirit of God, the eternal Spirit, it says. You know, Hebrews 9.14 says, Through that eternal Spirit, Jesus offered himself without spot to God. Jesus offered himself without spot. There was no sin in Jesus. And that eternal spirit, as Jesus hung on the tree, transferred the sin that you and I have committed. That eternal spirit transferred our sin, your sin, 
onto the body and soul of Jesus. Did you know that? Jesus took your sin and it was the Father that laid it on him. It was the Father that took the sin that you committed, that sin that plagues you day and night. The Father took that sin himself and he laid it on the body and the soul of Jesus. He did it through the eternal spirit. Oh, the plan that God had to rid us of sin, to bring us back to him, to reconcile us, to make peace between the Father and you and I. That plan was that eternal spirit was going to transfer everything that God had against you and he was going to take it and put it on the body of Jesus. Isn't that beautiful? If you know that, if you read this, Jesus became a murderer. He became an adulterer. He became a child molester. He became sexually immoral, in, immoral. He took it all on. He became the thief. He became the embezzler. He became the liar. He became the rioter. Do you see? Jesus took on your sin. The Father transferred it from you and he laid it on Jesus. Now verse seven, what happened with that sin? What happened with all the sin that Jesus took on him? And he took on the sins of the whole world. That's why the body broke apart. That's why every bone became out of joint. That's what sin will do to you. Verse seven, he was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth, he is brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before her shears is dumb so he opened not his mouth he was taken from prison and from judgment and who shall declare his generation for he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people was he stricken it was your sin on him it was my sin on him it was my sickness on him it was my poverty on him as all the curses against me were on Jesus. That is Galatians 2. And look at verse 10. Look at verse 10. Oh, if you want this, you're going to have to open up that Bible and you're going to have to read it over and over and over out loud and let it minister to you. You know what it says in Romans 10? It says, we faith cometh by hearing. The word of God and if you look at that chapter it's got talking about the gospel you want this in your heart open up that Bible and read it out loud and begin in Matthew Mark Luke and John now it says yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him it pleased the Lord to bruise Jesus it made the father happy to do this to Jesus. Why? Because he was after you. He was after you. He knew the only way that the Father was going to get you to go back to him, the only way you were going to be able to come into his presence, the only way there was going to be peace between you and God, was somebody was going to have to pay for what you've done. And the Father knew there was only one person was going to be able to do that and that was going to be his son Jesus and his son Jesus became a man like you like me and he went to the cross and when he was on the cross the father laid laid transferred all that you and I had done and he laid it on Jesus 
and it made him happy to do so because he knew he was going to get you out of the deal. Amen? For it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. He has made him sick. And thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. He shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days. How's he going to prolong his days? He's going to raise Jesus from the dead. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Verse 11. The Father, Jehovah, shall see the travail of his soul, of Jesus' soul. He's going to see Jesus suffering on the cross. And he's going to see Jesus suffering in hell for you and I, paying, paying for that sin. All the repercussions of the sin Jesus paid for. And the Father saw it. And when he saw that the sin was paid for, he was satisfied. He was satisfied. The death, burial, and resurrection made a satisfied God. He was satisfied with what Jesus did for you. He was satisfied with the sacrifice that Jesus made for you, for me. The Father is satisfied. That's the gospel. So that the, now that the Father is satisfied, all my sins are forgiven. Now that the Father is satisfied with the sacrifice of Jesus, I have been justified. Now that the Father is sacrificed or satisfied with the sacrifice of Jesus, my, my sicknesses can be healed. My poverty goes away and I'm prosperous. My welfare is paid for. My safety is paid for. My pain, my disease is paid for. And I can receive it. It can manifest in my life. The miracles happen because of what Jesus did for me on the cross. And he will do the same thing for you. That power that the Father used to get Jesus out of hell to raise him from the dead, that power is the kingdom power. That same power will work in us when we repent, when we change the way we're thinking and we believe what Jesus did for us, we commit to what Jesus did for us, we adhere to what Jesus did for us. Now, to even see the kingdom of God, we have to be born again. We have to be born again. Jesus said that in John 3. And he said that to a man, a Pharisee, that walked perfect in the law. You know, he didn't say to Nicodemus, Nicodemus, you're doing a good job following the law of Moses. You're doing a good job following those Ten Commandments. He didn't say that. You know what Jesus said to Nicodemus? He said, you must be born again. You must be born again. If we want to even see this power, we have to be born again. Turn with me to Romans 10, and I will read to you how we do that, because it's written right here. Romans 10, verse 9, this is how. We go to Jesus, and it says, If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Thou shall be born again. Thou shall receive Jesus. Would you like to do that? Would you like to put that start, begin? Would you like to begin putting that kingdom in your heart? And pray this prayer with me, right out of this verse. Jesus, come into my heart. Be Lord of my life. Guide me. Teach me. Fix me. And I ask this in Jesus' name. 
your name. Amen. You know what? That is one prayer that Jesus guaranteed will hear. That is one prayer he's waiting to hear from you. Amen. And if you've prayed it by the word of God, you are born again.